Greetings, pals. It's Allison Dixon flying solo here, which can only mean one thing. It's ding dong ditch time. I figure since it's the inaugural episode of the show within the show, I should hit the ground running. So let me just grease up my skis, pop 30 pills of meth, and we'll do this thing proper, shall we? Now, I'm willing to bet most people listening to this show have either watched or at least heard of the TV series Breaking Bad. It's the show that brought crystal meth to the fore of popular culture, such that when we see blue rock candy or vintage RVs in the desert, we immediately cry out, yeah, science! Further, bronze statues of the show's stars, Brian Cranston and Aaron Paul, were recently unveiled in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the city where its show and its spinoff, Better Call Saul, were set, which officially cements their status in the American tapestry. And in that show, meth is portrayed as the illicit, life-destroying insanity rock that it actually is. The drug is not only highly addictive, but it has detrimental effects on the physical and mental health of the user over time. But what far fewer people know is that methamphetamine not only was once perfectly legal, but various versions of this mega stimulant have been used in military settings as recently as the war in Afghanistan, particularly by bomber pilots in order to keep them awake and sharp for long periods in the sky. As recently as 2017, an American pilot blamed his use of amphetamines on a deadly friendly fire incident on Canadian soldiers. But let's wind the clock all the way back to 1919, when Japanese chemists learned how to synthesize methamphetamine by using red phosphorus and iodine to reduce down ephedrine, another common stimulant you've undoubtedly heard of, as it's used in the treatment of various conditions like narcolepsy, obesity, and nasal congestion. Ever tried to buy cold medicine containing pseudoephedrine and had to show your ID at the pharmacy counter? That's the magic stuff, kids. Well, without getting too terribly sciencey about all this, methamphetamine is ephedrine on steroids. Eh, not really, but colloquially, we'll just go with it for now. So, in the 1930s, the Germans refined this process and they created a non-prescription pill called Pervitin. Imagine just being able to walk into your local CVS to buy a bottle of meth pills. Ah, the 1930s were grand, were they not? It's contended by some that Adolf Hitler used the stuff and that this likely contributed to his eventual downfall, though I don't think I'm ready to blame the Holocaust on meth, so I'll just say it made a giant racist asshole into a giant racist asshole on speed. Pervitin was widely distributed to the militaries of Germany and Finland, who were unofficial allies during at least part of World War II, particularly because they had one common enemy, the Soviets. Finland's tensions with Russia shouldn't be news to anyone currently following the recent Russian invasion of Ukraine, but I digress. There have been many conflicts between the two countries throughout the last century, including the Winter War, which led to Russia getting a lot of Finland's territory after a treaty in 1940. Suffice it to say, the Russians and the Finnish have very little love for one another. Finland wanted to get that land back, and they were willing to ally briefly with the Nazis to get it. Eventually, Finland did fight against the Germans, though, but I'll get back to Finland in a second because I need to talk a little more about the drugs. So, Pervitin was kind of a miracle for the German military, particularly the elite forces and those who operated tanks and aircraft. It not only kept them awake, but they stayed active and cheerful, handy when tasked with the whole kill or be killed thing. They also didn't have to eat so much when riding the high. Think about the super soldier serums that have populated various comic books and sci-fi stories and realize that we've actually had it for a century. It was just called meth. And because it was meth, all these positives came at a great cost. That sleeplessness and lack of food led to irritability, as well as delirium and psychosis and hallucinations. 
things you really don't want running rampant among a group of people who have a lot of guns and bombs at their disposal. But the need for stimulants among military, especially during combat, is certainly nothing new. Coffee was, and still is, the most common go-juice, such that in its absence, soldiers were willing to boil any mixture of roots, tubers, and leaves to get some sort of stimulant effect to stay alert on the battlefield. With the advent of meth, it's easy to imagine that they thought they'd stumbled on the magical cure-all for fatigued troops. But there ain't no such thing as a free lunch, even one with a meth chaser. Eventually, after a lot of deaths and ghastly side effects associated with Pervitin, as well as the fact that it was being abused to kingdom come, in 1941, the German government heavily restricted the distribution of the drug to what amounted essentially to three tablets per soldier per month, and a doctor's prescription was also required. That said, civilian usage of the drug was also rampant. Reportedly, factory workers in Japan relied on their own branded version of it to keep productivity up at wartime levels. And I have to think getting blitzed out of your mind on crank probably made it easier to deal with the fear of having bombs dropped on you or getting a bad news telegram about a loved one. So yeah, the cat was out of the bag on Satan's rocket fuel. The good, the bad, the ugly. But... Regiments still had access to the pills, and they dosed them out on a special case-by-case basis. Now let's talk about one particular soldier, a 27-year-old Finnish man named Ivo Kuvenen, who was part of a ski patrol unit assigned to the Lapland region in 1944, which at that time was under Russian control. He and his fellow scouts had settled into camp in the morning after a long night of skiing and sub-zero temperatures through snow up to their knees. Now, I don't know about you, but I spend 10 minutes removing snow from my car or the walkway and I need a nap, so you can imagine how tired these guys were after spending the last few days out there. But that moment of exhaustion ended up being the moment a well-rested Soviet platoon decided to descend on them. So the skis go back on, and the Fens are on the run from what sounds like a lot of troops with guns. Imo, who was falling behind due to extreme fatigue, knew he needed to do something drastic before he fell victim to the Russians. He was also his unit's keeper of the meth, so you probably know where this is going. Well, he pulled out the small bottle of Pervitin, intending to take one tablet, but his mitts as well as the whole trying to outrun enemy gunfire thing, made him a little less than dexterous. So rather than dosing out one pill into his palm, he poured out the whole damn thing, some 30 pills, and decided, ah, fuck it, let's just take them all. So that, my friends, is when shit got real. Imo Kuvenen became a super soldier, and he skied his ever-loving ass off. The trade-off, of course, is with that much meth coursing through his body, he started tripping galaxy-sized balls. He faded in and out of consciousness, having brief lucid moments where he didn't remember where he'd gone and how he'd got there. He was eventually completely alone, without ammo or food, but he wasn't sure if it was because he'd outpaced his comrades or because they took his stuff and left him behind due to their inability to tolerate someone riding a dragon this fucking huge. But... That dragon was telling him what to do. It was telling him to ski directly for Finland. And because he had a compass and was just coherent enough to use it, he pointed his skis in that direction and started hoofing it toward home. In his saner moments, Imo recalled melting down snow in his little cook pot making pine needle tea. And that's what he subsisted on over several days. Pine needles are nature's little Christmas tree flavored gifts, especially in a survival situation tons of vitamin C and other nutrients. I personally know that from all my years watching Bear Grylls. I also learned you can squeeze water straight into your mouth from a handful of elephant dung, but again, I digress. I'm all blacked out a lot during his intense meth binge. The drug had him in its grip and it wasn't letting him go anytime soon. At some point, he spotted a fire burning in the distance and what looked like an encampment of Germans. He was saved, so he started skiing breakneck toward it. Except at the last second, he realized the soldiers weren't Germans, they were Russians. Well, shit. Too late to stop, he barreled straight through the enemy camp so fast, fueled by the pure white lightning of military-grade speed, that the Soviets who tried to chase him down soon gave up. 
After that insane encounter, Imo hallucinated a lot. At times, he thought he was back with his fellow soldiers who were encouraging him to keep going. Once, he did mighty battle with a wolverine, only to find out it was a tree. Sadly, his wrist compass was a casualty in that fight, and he eventually lost his backpack and cooking supplies, so the pine needle tea was no longer on the menu. Eventually, he encountered an abandoned cabin. But instead of lighting a fire in the fireplace in his drugged out state, he lit a fire on the wooden floor. Thankfully, the meth wouldn't allow him to fall asleep because the place eventually went up like a torch and he had to escape certain death yet again. As he skied, he continued to imagine he was seeing lights from settlements, only to realize he was following the North Star. But he eventually did find an abandoned German outpost. Sadly, before leaving, the Nazis rigged the whole place with mines, and Imo found one right away, badly injuring his foot in the explosion. But meth doesn't care about injuries. You've all no doubt seen the pits people dig into their skin at the height of a high. So what's a little destroyed foot with some bone splinters poking out? Imo kept exploring and found a door to a little dugout that promised provisions inside. Remember, he hasn't eaten in a few days, and he was no doubt starving by this point. Again, because the German soldiers were so awesome, they booby-trapped the door. Kaboom! This explosion threw Imo several yards away, shredding his clothes to pieces, which is really handy when you're out in the snow, with a blown-off foot and losing your goddamn mind from a wicked Scooby Snack bender. At some point, as Imo laid in the middle of the encampment beckoning death, Finnish soldiers eventually stumbled on the site during a patrol. Imo wasn't sure if he was rescued or hallucinating, but he called out to them anyway because why the hell not? But one of the patrol sergeants was wounded and they said they'd be back for him. And too delirious and weak to argue, Imo couldn't put up much of a fight. So as he waited for either an eternal nap or rescue, he spotted a Siberian jaybird and managed to kill it with one of his ski poles, after which he ate it raw. Unsurprisingly, he found it delicious. As a little segue, it's been widely reported that people starving in extreme survival situations will find things like raw fish eyes and other uncooked animal organs completely appetizing. They actually crave them. At some point, the brain switches over to craving straight up nutrients, forsaking any notion of flavor preference and food safety. If you've been skiing across the snowy countryside with only pine needle tea and methamphetamine to sustain you, I imagine even excrement would have the quality of a fine chocolate brownie. Sorry, not sorry. Okay, so this may be ding dong darkness time, but you all know I'm not above ending things on a lighter note. The Finnish and German soldiers actually returned to the encampment and Imo was rescued. Now, let's talk a moment about what Imo actually accomplished here in terms of time and distance. He was on the run for two weeks. Much of that time was probably him hanging out in various encampments, fighting imaginary wolverines and talking to fellow soldiers who weren't actually there. But in that two weeks, on little more than a pair of skis and a crystal-fueled prayer, Imo traveled 400 kilometers or about 250 miles. This makes me want to talk a little bit about the marathon. No, not the 26 miler folks run these days, the ancient Greek one, the OG marathon that started it all, that gave it its name. So a messenger from Athens named Pheopides, uh, forgive my pronunciation if that is wrong, uh, he was sent to Sparta to request aid when the Persians landed at Marathon, Greece. He ran about 150 miles in two days, that's 240 kilometers, and then he turned around and ran back, so that's 300 miles. He then ran another 40 kilometers or 25 miles to the battlefield near Marathon and then back to Athens to announce the Greek victory over Persia in the Battle of Marathon. And after that, he fell to his death. Like he j just gave out. His body was completely spent. That's a lot of miles to run. Now, Imo took a little more time. And of course, he didn't do quite as many miles as Pheopides, but he did do 250 miles on skis in brutal cold and snow and an unforgiving landscape. If Pheopides had had meth at his disposal, 
would he have lived? I mean, that's something to ponder. Because although Imo weighed only 94 pounds at the time of his rescue and had a heartbeat in excess of 200 beats per minute upon rescue, keep in mind the average uh, human heart rate, resting heart rate, is about 60 to 70 beats per minute. He not only survived this ordeal, but he went on to live a normal life and died at the age of 71. Granted, 71 isn't exactly ancient by today's standards, but for a guy who took a 250 mile cross country ski trip through a chunk of Russia while on a massive meth high, I'd say he did pretty damn well for himself. Today, Militaries across the world have attempted to curtail its reliance on amphetamines for service members prone to combat fatigue. Instead, they're using drugs like modafinil, another stimulant that is better tolerated and less addictive with few overall side effects. But it's worth pondering the role these drugs have played not only in the active battle phase, but in the aftermath. PTSD, suicides, addiction, and so many other health problems are not as uncommon in combat veterans as folks would like to believe. We still continue to hear the stories of soldiers exposed to Agent Orange and the burn pits from the Persian Gulf War. The wages of war are great and largely still kept in the shadows. I urge anyone who knows anybody who has experienced combat to maybe have a conversation with them if they're up for it, to learn more of these stories and increase their awareness in these matters. Over the course of these Ding Dong Ditch episodes, I hope to highlight more such stories because not only are they fascinating to consider from a pure human survival standpoint, I think they're also important just to factor in these stories whenever we consider whether war is the path that we want to take when dealing with diplomatic matters. So on that note, if you liked this story of raw methadled bravery and endurance, please hop over to the Ding Dong Darkness Time page on iTunes and drop a rating or a review. Also, don't hesitate to send me suggestions for weird, dark, macabre, just downright interesting stories of today or yesterday. This particular story about Imo Kuvenin came courtesy of my son, Nate. So you can always reach me at ddarknesstime at gmail.com or through my Twitter and Instagram accounts, the same handles, ddarknesstime. And season three of the show is in the works. But you can expect regular installments of Ding Dong Ditch to keep you entertained in the meantime. So until the next one, be good, you little ding dongs.